Hey guys, welcome to the Holy Shed in London again, uh, where I've been doing all kinds of things over the past few days this morning, talking about my one of my favourite resurrection stories in the Gospels, the story of Thomas. Uh, did that at St Leonard's in Streatham. Um, but also, earlier in the week, I was blessed to be able to uh, go into the studio, the real place at the BBC, to record Pause for Thought. What a difference it makes being there in person rather than, you know, just down the line. Anyway, if you missed it, you can find the link on my Facebook page. And it was inspired by this incredible creature. What a beauty, hey. I was a bit flummoxed, as I often am, actually, this week as to what to write for Pause for Thought. So I went for a walk. Always works for me, actually. Always a good idea. And I passed a field where this guy was chewing some grass quite a distance away. And as I stood there admiring him, it just crossed my mind as to whether he had any awareness of me at all. And even as I thought that, he turned around toward me and just walked right across the field until our faces were less than a metre apart. It was an awesome moment, especially for a city boy like me, not used to hanging out with horses. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to talk about you on Radio 2. And there it is. The creative process right there. So hey, if you have a candle, let's light a flame together. Um, let's light a flame together for ourselves, really, in a world where there are so many things that can drag your spirit down. You know, my newfound friend, my newfound horsey friend, uh, he lifted my spirit. He put the world into perspective for me in those moments that I was just there uh, chatting away with him. Um, so sure, yeah, there, there are a lot of things going on in the world um, that fundamentally, you know, are harrowing and, and horrible, but we can't do anything to change them. Not very much anyway. And I think it's important to guard your spirit against being overwhelmed by things that basically you can't do anything about. So let's light a candle and uh, take a moment of quiet to just let go of stuff that's beyond our control and reconnect with that still centre within, which is always there, but is shouted down mostly by all the noise in our heads. But it's always there and it's a healing place in each of us. And we say together our Holy Shed Serenity Prayer, holding in our hearts again the battered and brutalised people of the Ukraine and others around the world in horrible situations of oppression. God grant me the serenity to live fully and generously through circumstances I cannot control. Hope to keep on imagining better times for myself and the world and courage to change what I can instead of simply leaving it to others. Amen. By the way, I'll probably be going for another walk tomorrow because I'm doing Pause for Thought on Wednesday this week as well and still have no idea what I'm doing. Now, if you wander through YouTube land, as I often do, uh, you will quickly spot that the term woke prompts incredibly strong feelings you know you'll find no end of rants about the subject from this side and that side of the argument the term woke uh, originates in african-american vernacular to mean vigilant or awake uh, to the deceptions and machinations of racism and discrimination in society um, and then following the the police killing of michael brown in missouri in 2014 Woke became the uh, cautionary watchword of Black Lives Matter. Since then, the word has kind of exploded really in many directions, creating uh, a culture war between those who are perceived, not always fairly, but who are perceived on the one hand to be um, right-wing reactionaries 
and on the other hand, left-wing progressives. And Wokers, you know, the, the left-wing progressives, as it were, Wokers want to defend the rights of all kinds of minority groups, while anti-Wokers oppose what they see as political correctness gone mad, you know, aimed at shutting down free speech in society. Well, as a left-leaning, you know, progressively committed person, you know, to social justice and all that stuff, I guess I'm naturally inclined towards wokeness. However, I confess that it's not without some reservations for various reasons. To begin with, and not least, uh, I'm cagey about nicking a term that, as I say, has a history, expressing an experience of racism and discrimination which isn't mine. That said, woke has now burst the banks to describe people of all sorts around the world who say that they want a fairer, better, kinder, more just sort of world, which I certainly do, and I know you do too, dear Shedsters. And yet, ironically, it's this second way, uh, you know, in which woke is used um, to, to, to talk about, you know, wanting a fairer, better, kinder, more just world, that I actually have some further reservations about identifying with. Basically, because I think it, in many instances, wokeness has become another toxic divider that can prove, in some instances, as discriminatory as the discriminations that it vehemently denounces. In principle, I love it. I love the term woke. And yes, on balance, I do identify with it. Uh, I believe the ground in which injustice thrives is an undisturbed, unacknowledged status quo. You know, a situation where horrible, prejudicial, sometimes evil and hateful circumstances and attitudes and behaviours can become the normal, undetected landscape of our communal life. I think this is the sense in which the Apostle Paul uses the term world in Romans chapter 12, when he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Uh, so do not settle, in other words, for a status quo, when that status quo is in direct opposition to the very values and qualities of God's kingdom that you value, including love and justice and inclusiveness, etc., to be transformed by the renewing of the mind is just another way of saying, wake up, you know, wake up to what's happening here. Be woke, alive, alert to the attitudes and practices which marginalise, damage, oppress, discriminate against, limit fellow human beings. So yes, in this sense, I definitely aspire to be woke. I don't think I am woke enough, but that's what I aspire to. I don't know if you've listened to um, the conversation that I had with my fellow scouser, John Bishop, the comedian, on his podcast. Um, <laughs> I loved it. It was, a great, it was a great conversation. And at one point, holding a clearly well-read copy of How to Be a Bad Christian and a Better Human Being, John said, so what you're really saying, Dave, is don't be a dick. Well, honestly... I mean, I couldn't ask for a better one-line exposition of exactly what I think the book's about. Spot on. I believe that um, behaving in a manner which is racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, disabledist, religiously bigoted, classist, all of these things is basically being a dick, you know. It's sleepwalking, a semi-comatose existence in which there is no awareness of how other people are feeling or being affected by our words and actions. So wake up. Uh, absolutely. But here's the thing. I think you can sleepwalk in wokeness. Mixing a metaphor, I know. But uh, I often say that there are many kinds of fundamentalism in the world, including woke fundamentalism. The term fundamentalism, of course, was coined in 1920 uh, or in the 1920s sometime to describe conservative evangelical Christians who opposed the onset and the influences of modernism. And they, and they did this by formulating a set of fundamentals, 
fundamental beliefs which they believed would keep the faith pure. So fundamentalism is basically a defensive strategy against heretical influences. And the outcome is mostly, I have to say, rigid, dogmatic, doctrinaire, exclusive uh, forms of faith, a framework of, of absolute certainty. But in fact, you know, there are countless other frameworks of certainty, many of which are secular in content and yet deeply religious or sectarian in their outlook and modus operandi, which, in the immortal words of my Scouse friend John Bishop, causes people to act like dicks. My caution about the label weight that woke rather, <laughs> is not unlike my caution about the word Christian. Both words are loaded and easily convey their own forms of elitism and exclusion. Thank goodness that I'm not like them sort of attitude. And the problem is, often the things that we condemn in others have been, or maybe still are, part of our life too albeit unrecognised or you know, disguised in some way. It was Socrates who said, the unexamined life is not worth living. Jesus said, do not judge so that you may not be judged. And, and he went on to talk about you know, dealing with the log in your own eye before you're dealing with the splinter in the other person's. The problem with some wokeness is that it veers into its own form of puritanism and judgmentalism. The wonderful Barack Obama puts it rather well, I think, in some comments that he made, which you'll find in, uh, you know, in social media all over the place. Listen to this. You know, this, this idea of purity and you're never compromised and you're always politically woke and all that stuff, I, you should get over that quickly. <laughs> the, world, the world is messy. There are ambiguities. People who do really good stuff have flaws. Right. People who you are fighting may love their kids. And, you know, share certain things with you. And, and, and I think that one danger I see among young people, particularly on college camps, is Malia and I talk about this. Yara goes to school with my daughter. Um, but I do get a sense sometimes now among certain young people, and this is accelerated by social media, there is this sense sometimes of the way of me making change is to be as judgmental as possible about other people. And that's enough. Like if I tweet or hashtag about how you didn't do something right or used the word wrong verb or then I can sit back and feel pretty good about myself because, man, you see how woke I was? I called you out. <laughs> Let me get on TV, <laughs> watch my show, watch Gronish. <laughs> um, you know, that's not, that's not activism. That, that's not bringing about change. You know, if, 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 if all you're doing is casting stones, uh, you know, you're, you're probably not going to get that far. That's easy to do. Wise man. You see, what we must never lose sight of is the true objective of wokeness, which is a better world, a world of love, of kindness, of civility, and of true humility. In the end, I don't see us improving the situation by you know just reveling in a call out culture or, or cancelling everybody who disagrees with us that really in the end doesn't change anything you're just squashing down something that you don't like you know i think we must you know fight against bad ideas and not against people it may make me feel better to get someone cancelled but it doesn't as i say really change anything i mean ask mary whitehouse I remember her trying to cancel homosexuality and sex outside marriage in the 1960s. Get it off the telly and all that kind of stuff. You know, I think if we're going to promote civility 
in our world, kindness. We must tackle incivility in as civil a way as we possibly can. I'll never forget listening to Bruce Kent, who was then director of CND, the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, talking to a really large crowd at Greenbelt about his vision of a more peaceful world without nuclear weapons. Um, And I later had the opportunity to interview him, actually, and discovered what a wonderful, gracious man he is. Anyway, in the midst of his talk, a young guy from America put his hand up and began berating Bruce Kent's views. Uh, He said something like, you know, you people need to understand that America is keeping the world safe. You need us to do this, and da-da-da-da-da. Well, while he was speaking, the, the very unsympathetic audience... Uh, jeered and booed him and sort of told him to sit down. But Bruce Kent quietened the crowd and told them to let the man speak. And uh, when he'd finished his little speech, Bruce Kent very graciously thanked him for his words and said he was glad that he spoke up and that it, it must have been difficult saying what he said in that context. And he then went on in equal with equal grace to completely dismantle all the arguments the young man had put forward. And, uh, yeah, it, it, was ju- it was just amazing. You know, I have no real recollection of Bruce Kent's talk that year at Greenbelt, but I'll never, ever forget uh, that moment. I'll never forget his spirit of grace and compassion, whilst also, you know, quite mercilessly speaking his mind. It represents the kind of wokeness that I aspire to and admire. As Barack Obama said, it's easy to throw stones, you know, to shout slogans, try to shut people up, but that's not true activism, as he said. Uh, We must never forget that we're all human beings. You know, most of us on all sides uh, try to love our kids and we treat our dogs kindly, you know, all that sort of stuff. But, you know, I believe that what our world needs right now is a revolution of spirit, not toxic sectarianism, but a revolution of spirit. Let me play you a video about two people, a Muslim woman and a Trump supporter, having a conversation together. And it's it's a surprising and beautiful interaction. Take a look at this. I noticed you with the hat Mm -hmm. and I noticed that you were surrounded by some people and I noticed that they were being kind of threatening and then somebody snatched your hat off your head and that's the point where I something kind of snapped inside me because (laughs) I wear a um, Muslim hijab and I've been in situations where people have tried to snatch it off my head Wow! and I rushed towards you and I just started screaming leave them alone give me that back I don't think we could be any further apart as people. And yet it was just kind of like this common, that's not okay moment. You are genuinely the only Muslim person I know. I just, (laughs) it's not that I've actively avoided. It's just, I've just never been in the position where I can uh, interact Mm -hmm. for an extended period of time. So I guess my views on uh, the Muslim community have been, influenced by a lot of the news articles and and things of that nature. I feel like a lot of times in the media, you don't see the normal Muslim, the one that listens to classic rock like I do. (laughs) You don't don't meet that Muslim. Can you tell me about where you grew up? What was that part of your life like? So I was born in Baghdad, in Iraq. I moved to the U.S. when I was 10 years old. Okay. Being uh, a Muslim girl, I stood out in almost every single way that you can (laughs) in middle school, the worst time to stand out. What about you? How was it like when you grew up? I was homeschooled, mm-hmm. so it was it was a vastly different experience socially. It was I didn't have, I guess, as many friends as most people would. I only went to public school one year of my life, and I got in three fights and I lost all of them. <laughs> so I hope that I can be the reason that someone decides to talk to someone 
I'd like for this to encourage other people to engage in more conversations yeah. with people that you don't agree with. That's what it's all about. I'm so glad I wasn't the only one who felt like that. What an incredible piece of interaction and dialogue that is. Um, it's amazing, isn't it, what a small but courageous act of kindness, an act of simple civility can achieve. Uh, you know, what happens when two people actually speak to each other instead of shout at each other? You know, Jesus didn't say, silence your enemies, cancel them, rile against them. He said, love your enemies, which didn't mean, you know, go all pink and fluffy or just say you know racism and transphobia and all the rest of it can just go and challenge not at all the world needs passionate activists but it also desperately needs kindness which isn't you know candy floss uh, to me kindness is is love in action it's strong firm unflinching resilient in the face of opposition but it involves respect and humility, remembering, you know, that we're all on a journey. I don't know if you're aware of the writer and stylist Ayashat Akanbi, um, a British Nigerian woman who you can find quite a lot of uh, material from on the Internet. She gives one of the most eloquent expressions of what I am trying to say here in uh, a, YouTube, a short YouTube video called The Problem with Wokeness. Check it out because... I mean, the woman is amazing, and uh, yeah, you just feel she's she's hit the nail so bang on the head. So, guys, here's the thing: you know, no one has a monopoly on toxicity, no one has a monopoly on truth. What I learn from following Jesus is a pathway of unflinching truth speaking, combined with unflinching compassion, and there, I think is a formula that really can help to make the world a better place. I want to finish with a Mary Oliver poem, why not? Uh, based on uh, a story about a beautiful painting uh, by a German artist called Franz Mark uh, of four horses. And um, he's someone who said that he always strove in his paintings to look for and try to convey the inner spiritual side of things. So, yeah, one of his most famous paintings is this Four Blue Horses. But during the First World War, he was con conscripted uh, to fight in the German army. And a shell explosion in the first days of the war's longest battle sent a metal splinter into his skull and wiped him out, killed him instantly. Moved by the story and by his painting, Mary Oliver wrote a poem called Franz Mark's Blue Horses and I think it's pretty sensational here, here it is, take a look and there's the painting she writes I step into the painting of the four blue horses I'm not even surprised that I can do this one of the horses walks toward me his blue nose noses me lightly I put my arm over his blue mane not holding on just commingling. He allows me my pleasure. Franz Mark died a young man, shrapnel in his brain. I would rather die than try to explain to the blue horses what war is. They would either faint in horror or simply find it impossible to believe. I do not know how to thank you, Franz Mark. Maybe our world will grow kinder eventually. Maybe the desire to make something beautiful is the peace of God that is inside each of us. Now all four horses have come closer, are bending their faces toward me as if they have secrets to tell. I don't expect them to speak, and they don't. If being so beautiful isn't enough, what could they possibly say? Ah. I just love it. And, that, and it's those lines in the middle, <coughs> which I like so much. 
Maybe our world will grow kinder eventually. Maybe the desire to make something beautiful is the peace of God that's inside each of us. And there's clearly a reference there to the shrapnel that, that entered Franz Mark, but, but she's saying there's this shrapnel of divinity in each of us. The desire to make something beautiful is the peace of God that is inside each of us. Just stunning. So, um, let's pray a prayer together. God of friends and enemies, whose love conspires to blur the line between the two, enlarge our hearts that we may gaze into the eyes of another to find ourselves looking back, even when minds and hearts are worlds apart. Teach us to stand resilient, owning our own truth with integrity, while also attending to doubts and loves, longing to be heard. Help us to see that even with the comfort of certainty, truth always comes to us as a crumb and never an entire loaf. Amen. So, hey, I think it's that time. Time to make a toast. The Holy Shed, Holy Sacrament. And uh, as you can see, not a lot left here, but enough. So, pour a little drop. If you've got a drink of any sort, then I invite you to pick it up right now and join me in a toast. A toast to being awake. Awake to the deeper intuitions of our own soul. Awake to the experiences, the hurts and disappointments of other people around us. Awake to Mother Earth and our need to live with her more kindly. Dear friends, to life, Laheim. So, if you like what the shed's all about, you enjoy what we're doing here, you can support us, which would be wonderful. Buy us a coffee or whatever. The link to the coffee site is here on the screen and it's always at the top of the posts on the Holy Shed Facebook page. And uh, thank you so much to all of you who support us with this, but in lots of other ways too. It's much, much appreciated. So, <coughs> excuse me. What I'm going to finish with today is the Holy Shed motto. Actually, they're the words that I finished my book, Black Sheep and Prodigals, with. Um, live passionately, believe skeptically, love extravagantly. Live passionately. Live from your passion. You know, not from apathy. Live from your passion. Never compromise what you truly believe. Believe skeptically. Never be afraid to believe. Never be afraid to doubt whoever's doing the talking, even yourself. I doubt myself all the time. Love extravagantly. Stick as close as you can to the golden rule. Treat others, whoever they are, the way you would wish to be treated. And there it is. Live passionately. Believe skeptically. Love extravagantly. Summed up as stay human. So I'm going to finish today with... Uh, a great song by the wonderful Eric Bibb. And um, the film in this is a bit ropey. It's, it was the best version of it that I could find. So um, I, I thought I'd put up with the, with the images. But the song is Don't Let Nobody Drag Your Spirit Down. And uh, I think Eric Bibb is fabulous. Been with our friends Bill and Eve to see him perform on a couple of occasions. And um, he's a man who exudes this stay human spirit so enjoy this and i'll see you soon have a great week stay human bye you might slip you might slide stumble and fall by the roadside don't you ever let go back Drag your spirit down Well, we're walking up to heaven Don't let nobody turn you around Walk with the rich Walk with the poor Learn from everyone That's what life